Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be continuing on with our Bible Study With Me series going through the book of Esther and today we're going to be covering Esther chapter 2. As always, if you haven't already, make sure you go back and watch the video on Esther chapter 1 first. But a little refresher, the book of Esther is a historical narrative. And so this is a story we see in the Bible that happened in history. And there are even sources outside of the Bible, historical sources, that also speak to these events. And so this is a historical narrative that is set over a hundred years after the Babylonian exile of Israelites from their land. And so the Israelites have been exiled from their land and now this is a hundred years later and some of the Jews did return to Jerusalem, but many did not. And Esther tells the story of a Jewish community that's living in Susa, which is the capital city of the ancient Persian Empire, which like we talked about last week was massive. It covered so, so much territory. And so essentially this is the story of a Jewish maiden who becomes queen of Persia, spoiler alert, and then this other bad guy, sort of the villain of the story, who launches this plan to destroy the Jews. And in the end, his plot is thwarted by Esther and then another key player who we're gonna meet in this chapter, Mordecai, and Esther risks her life to save her people. Kind of a key point to remember about the book of Esther is that God's name is actually not mentioned in this book anywhere. So his name is not in this book, but his hand certainly is. And he, even as we don't have this overt kind of description telling us what God is doing, we can see that he is moving behind the scenes, setting things in place to orchestrate his purposes. Another refresher, I want to read the theme statement for this book that I got from the Bible Project overview of Esther, and it says that God's seeming absence does not mean that he has abandoned his people. He uses the faithfulness of even morally compromised people living in a messy world to accomplish his purposes and fulfill his promises. This book asks us to trust God even when we can't see him working and to hold to the confident hope that no matter how bad things get, God is actively working to redeem his world. And so that's a little bit of the refresher on context. And now I just wanna give us a refresher on what has happened in the story so far so that we can kind of pick up where we left off. And so essentially we have King Ahasuerus, which like we talked about, sometimes he's also known as King Xerxes, but in this translation here, it's King Ahasuerus. And so that's what we'll refer to him as, even though it's a little hard to say. But King Ahasuerus, who is the king of Persia, this huge, huge empire, he holds this six month party essentially to display his greatness. And then this party culminates in a seven day feast. And in this feast, King Ahasuerus asks his wife, who is Queen Vashti, to essentially parade her beauty in front of his drunk friends and she refuses. And we talked more about kind of the nuance in this and what might've actually really been going on here in chapter one, but essentially he makes this request and she says no, and the king is now enraged. And so he asks his confidants what should be done. And they basically cancel him and say, look, Vashti is never again to come before you, the king, her husband, and it is decided that her position, the position of queen, should be given to another better than she, is what the text says. And so an edict is then sent out that every man must be master in his household. So basically they didn't want what happened with Queen Vashti to give women in the province any ideas that they shouldn't be obeying their husbands. And they're essentially looking to make an example of her and to have this harsh punishment so that it dissuades women across the kingdom, across the province, from not listening to or obeying their husbands. And so the chapter ends off with this need and the need is for a new queen. And so that is now where we are gonna pick up in Esther chapter two. 
and there's two main subheadings in this chapter. The first covers verses 1 through 18, and it is Esther chosen queen, again, spoiler alert. And then the second subheading covers verses 19 through 23, and it is Mordecai discovers a plot. And like I mentioned in the chapter one video, because this is a narrative, it is a story, I wanna to try to break it up as little as possible. And so rather than stopping after each subheading, we're just gonna read through the entire chapter once, and then we'll go back through and kind of talk through it, unpack it, and we'll kind of glean the biblical principles that we can glean from it. But then I'm also gonna give an overview, a comprehensive overview of just the different lessons we can learn from the book of Esther. I'm gonna give that in the chapter 10 video because that's gonna be a pretty short one. And so we'll do that to sort of wrap everything up. And so we're gonna go ahead and get into it. But before we do, if you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to my channel. If you haven't already, that is a huge way that you can support me and help me continue you to make these Bible study videos. And then again, if you find this video helpful or encouraging, if you're enjoying this study, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up and then maybe share this video with a friend who you think would want to go through this study with you. But with that being said, let's go ahead and get into it now. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it and turn with me to Esther chapter two. Verse one, after these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa the citadel under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. Now there was a Jew in Susa the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is, Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at, and when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now when the turn came for each young woman to go in to King Ahasuerus, after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women, when the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. 
And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tibet in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was called Esther's Feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people, as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Okay, so that is Esther chapter two. Now let's go ahead and unpack it a little bit. So the first thing I wanna read is a note from my study Bible here on verse one. And this is talking about when, you know, it says King Ahasuerus, his anger abated, and then he remembered Vashti and what she had done to him and what had been decreed against her. And so this note from my study Bible says, in a more sober mood, the king apparently regrets dismissing his beautiful queen. And when I first read that, I was like, wait, really? That's not really the vibe I got. He doesn't seem to be sober or regretting anything. He seems very eager to jump into meeting all these beautiful young virgins now. He doesn't seem to really miss his queen. Um, but there's another note here that I was reading through in a different commentary that was talking about how four years have actually passed now since everything happened in chapter one. And we'll see that later on in this chapter where it gives us like kind of a time marker stamp that we can compare um, from one in chapter one. But four years have passed and some historians believe that due to the timing, he is now revisiting this whole ordeal with Vashti because he was was unsuccessful in his attempt to invade Greece, which again, historically would have happened around this time frame. And so basically he becomes frustrated that military things aren't working out. And then he now comes home and does this whole ordeal of having all of these women brought in to distract himself. And so when you have that kind of information, then in light of that, when you read Esther chapter two, verse one, it kind of makes a little bit more sense because it says when his anger had been abated and he remembered Vashti. So again, this was four years ago now. And so in that sense, maybe it's like he's discouraged that his conquering Greece didn't go according to plan or invading Greece didn't go according to plan. And so now he's come home and he doesn't have the companionship of his wife that he had before, his queen, and he's looking to cheer himself up with other beautiful women. And so that's what sort of launches this whole thing of all these women being brought in. And so they're brought in to a harem and they're brought under the care of a eunuch, specifically the king's eunuch. And a eunuch is a man who has been castrated. And as I was reading in the commentary, it was saying that oftentimes eunuchs were given roles like this of sort of supervising women. And so the eunuch has them under his care and they're brought into the harem. Now a harem is a separate part of a household, or in this case, a palace that is reserved for additional wives because in that time, in that culture, there was polygamy or multiple wives. And so it was a separate part of the household reserved for wives, concubines, and female servants. And so that is where all these women were being brought into. A note on that, because it says they're bringing in women from all across the province. It literally says that 
the king appointed officers in all of the provinces of his kingdom, which is 127 provinces, to gather all these beautiful young women. There probably would have been likely around 25 million women across the provinces in that time. Now, not all of them might have been in the age range of eligibility, but generally speaking, there would have been about 25 million women in these provinces. And so they are narrowing it down from that massive number. And then a note from the Enduring Word commentary says that the Jewish historian Josephus says that Ahasuerus, when all was said and done, when all these women were brought into the harem, that he had a total of 400 women selected. The Enduring Word commentary also says that this was sort of like a Miss Persian Empire contest and the winner would become queen instead of Vashti. Another thing I wanted to note about this section, just the first couple verses here, is that once again, we see the king kind of looking to other people to see what he should do. So he remembers Vashti, what she had done, the decree against her. He goes to the young men who attended him and they're the ones who give this suggestion of this giant beauty contest, essentially. And it says that this pleased the king, and so he did so. So basically, he liked their idea and was like, sure, let's go ahead and make this happen. Now, continuing on into verse 5, we are introduced to Mordecai. And it says that Mordecai was the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. And so essentially what we learn from this section is that Mordecai would have been the fourth generation of a Jew who was deported in the Babylonian exile under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And so his great grandfather, who is Kish that we see in this text, would have been the one that was deported. And so likely Mordecai grew up his entire life not in Jerusalem. And so we're introduced to Mordecai. And then in verse seven, it says that he was bringing up Hadassah, which like we talked about in chapter one, was the Hebrew name that Esther would have been born with. And then Esther, is the Persian name she was later given and it says that Esther is the daughter of Mordecai's uncle which would have made her his cousin and so this is his cousin that he is essentially raising and caring for her because it says that she lost both her father or and her mother and so she was an orphan and so Mordecai is raising her taking care of her and then she is now kind of brought in with everything that's happening among all these women who are brought in to the harem. And so she is among that group. And when this edict was proclaimed to go search among the provinces, she was then gathered in Susa the Citadel, it says, in the custody of Hegai, who is this eunuch who is gonna be kind of taking care of all these women. Esther is in the custody of Hegai, and right off the bat in verse nine, we see that it says the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And him taking favor with Esther, I think right off the bat, is evidence of God's hand because we could say, you know, it just so happened that Esther was one of the 400 among millions who were brought into Susa. And it just so happened that Esther took favor with this eunuch. But there were a lot of beautiful women, probably a lot to choose from, yet God had a plan and there was a purpose in this. And we see that Esther is the one who is brought in. Esther is the one who gains favor with this eunuch who is in charge of all of them. And because of this favor that she gains with Haggai, she is given cosmetics and food beyond the normal allotment that other women were getting. And she is also given seven young maidservants and then she is also moved to the best place in the harem. And so right off the bat, we see God's favor on her. And then in verse 10, it says that Esther had not made known her people or her kindred because Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And so again, that was part of the reason for her Persian name Esther is because it is concealing this Hebrew name Hadassah, which would kind of give way to her Jewish descent. And this right here, the fact that she is concealing this fact and that Mordecai tells her to conceal this fact, this is the first hint we get that in this time, the Jews really weren't regarded so well. And we're gonna see more what that looks like as this story unfolds. 
And then in verse 11, it says that every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. And we just see this picture here of her caretaker, the person who has raised her, staying close by, keeping a very close watch on her, knowing this could potentially be a dangerous situation. And we just see his care for her demonstrated in that. And so all these women brought in to the harem are now undergoing 12 months of beautification, which is just so, so crazy. A note I read in the Enduring Word commentary was saying how Persians were known for their ancient customs of preparations for the bride. And so it would have been typical to go through all these different beauty preparations, but another reason for this lengthy amount of time in preparation, and this is something I hadn't thought about before, but another reason was to tell if the woman had become pregnant coming into the harem, because that would be enough time where if there was gonna be a growing baby, that would be determined. And that way the king wouldn't be charged with fathering a child that wasn't his. So maybe a child that had already been conceived before the woman came into the harem. And so that was something they were also trying to detect and so these women all go through these 12 months of beautification and they're sort of awaiting their turn to go in to king ahasuerus like it says in verse 12 and a note here is that every single one of these women would sleep with king ahasuerus when it was their turn and then one of these women would become his wife and this kind of points back to what we talked about last week in chapter one of the moral ambiguity that, you know, all of these different women were sleeping with King Ahasuerus and Esther is a part of this. She is a part of what's going on here. And so we talked about how, you know, we see these characters kind of involved in different things in their culture that went against the Torah, went against what God wants for them, what God has commanded. And so we're not necessarily given an example of what to perfectly follow in them, but we are shown an example of faithfulness and how God uses even imperfect people to accomplish his purposes. But on the other side of this, we also don't really know what choice Esther had in this whole matter. If she was kind of willingly going along with all of this or if she was brought in not of her own choice. And so we don't really know that part of it here, but regardless, this is what was going on. I want to read another note from my study Bible just about this whole beautification and this whole process of selecting a queen to kind of give us more understanding. But it says both the time involved and the cosmetics used indicate the elaborate nature of the beauty treatment the chosen women received. Myrrh is used, which is an expensive perfume obtained from trees native to Africa and Southern Asia. And then it says that when it was the woman's turn to go into the king, she was given whatever she desired. In the evening, she would go in. In the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Shazgaz the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. And so a note on this is that women officially recognized as the king's mistresses were housed separately in the second harem, having a lower status than his wife or wives. Each woman's first night with the king was her initiation as a concubine. For some, there would be no other such night. And so basically they're having all this preparation to have one night with the king. It may or may not be their only night with the king. And another note from the Enduring Word commentary says that theoretically a year of spa treatments sounds nice, but we have to remember the destiny, which again is one night with the king. And if chosen, this woman would be his queen until she displeased him like Vashti did. And then as for the other 399 who were not chosen, they were banished to the harem where they stayed either a wife or a concubine, but rarely, if ever, saw the king again, and they were never free to marry another man, essentially living as a perpetual widow. And I really never realized that part of the story. It just seemed like, okay, great, there's this giant beauty contest, Esther is chosen, but to think about the other 399 who are basically cut off from the possibility of marrying another man, from living a free life, but are just living in this harem to kind of be waiting for whenever the king felt like seeing them, that's 
really crazy to think about. And so in verse 15, we get to the point of the story where it is Esther's turn to go in and spend a night with the king. And it says that she asked for nothing except for what Haggai, the king's eunuch, advised her. And so she's seeking his advice. She's listening to it. She's obeying it. We see her do the same thing with Mordecai. She is seeking out the wisdom and being obedient to that. And then it says, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head. And so Esther is winning favor, not only of the eunuch who's in charge of her, not only of the king, but of all who saw her. And so now kind of unpacking what we referenced earlier, when Esther is chosen to be queen at this point in the story, Four years have actually already passed since Vashti had been dethroned. So in Esther chapter 1 verse 3, it starts off by saying in the third year of the king's reign. And then chapter 2 here in chapter 2 verse 16, we are told that it is the seventh year of his reign. That's also something I didn't catch before. I thought this all kind of flowed together. But again, four years have passed and potentially the king has tried to invade Greece and then that didn't work out and now he's come back and started this whole contest. And so Esther is chosen as queen and to celebrate, the king essentially waives taxes and gives gifts with royal generosity. And so he gives this big feast, calls it Esther's feast, waives the taxes and gives gifts with royal generosity, which a note on that, because I wasn't sure what that meant, but a note from my study Bible says that this means that it was probably in the form of food given to the poor so that all could share in the celebrations. And so this was a joyous thing for essentially the entire kingdom or province or empire of Persia. Now continuing into the second subheading, the sort of second portion of this chapter where Mordecai discovers a plot. So it says that the virgins were gathered together the second time and Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. So there is a distinction here from before he would walk around in the front of the court of the harem and now he is sitting at the king's gate. And a note on this is that he is an official now, probably because of Esther's influence with the king. And so when she's become queen, when she is made queen, it also has implications now for Mordecai and he's sitting at the king's gate. And then it says again in verse 20, Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. And I have a note here in my journaling Bible that I read, that I wrote from one of the previous times I read this. And it just says, the obedience Esther was able to display here was possible because she had learned it growing up. And so she was accustomed to obeying Mordecai, who was her primary caregiver. And so now she was accustomed to that in this situation where it really mattered. And I wrote down here an implication of that or sort of a parallel to that in our walks with God, that we need to learn obedience to God in the seemingly small things. Really, no things are small. Obedience matters at every level, but we need to learn obedience to God in the seemingly small things so that it is a reflex when the stakes are more consequential. So we've got Esther concealing her Jewish descent per the command of Mordecai. We've got Mordecai sitting at the king's gate which would associate having a position with the decision makers and men of influence in the kingdom. And now I wanna read this other note from my study Bible on what's about to happen next. And so it's essentially saying that Mordecai is in the right place at the right time to serve King Ahasuerus and kind of hearing about this plan to kill him. And this is one of many examples where readers of the book of Esther are meant to recognize God's hidden direction of events, though his name is not explicitly mentioned. And so again, it could just seem like Mordecai just so happens to be in the right place at the right time to overhear this conversation, but we know that God strategically placed him there. And so he passes this information along to Esther and Esther tells the king, it says in the name of Mordecai there in verse 22, 
And these men, when, when this whole thing is investigated and it's found to be true, these men who were plotting against the king were hanged on gallows. And a note from the Enduring Word commentary says that the word for gallows is literally tree. And so this most likely refers to actually impalement on a stake. And so this stake that is in the ground with a sharp top that these men are then impaled on. And so Mordecai uncovers this plot to kill the king, but he is not recognized for this yet. But we are told in verse 23 that it says it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king, which is going to be an important thing to remember as this story continues to unfold. And I think it also gives us an important lesson here that in our own situations, we might not immediately see recognition for doing the right thing. We might not see vindication in certain situations, but the story also isn't over yet. And so Mordecai doesn't receive that recognition, but the story isn't over yet here. And that's just kind of a reminder to us to do the right thing, knowing that we might not always receive the type of recognition that we're looking for, but ultimately we should be doing it because it's the right thing and because we're seeking to honor God. And I just want to read this verse from Matthew 6, 19 through 21 as a reminder. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so our goal should all ultimately be an eternal goal, again, seeking to honor and glorify God. And we never know how he is going to work, how he is potentially going to bring things full circle, which we are definitely gonna see with Mordecai. And so that is it for Esther chapter two. I mentioned in the chapter one video that we're not gonna be doing the deeper study in the scribe Bible journal in every single chapter because some chapters are more just narrative that we're unpacking and there will be some chapters where there'll be little tidbits for us to go into deeper study on but today's video we're not going to have that and so this is it for Esther chapter two. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and then comment down below letting me know what your favorite takeaway was from Esther chapter two or something new that you learned. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you back here next week for Esther chapter three. Bye.